Hi, uh, thanks for joining the webinar today. My name is Justin Nemers, and today we're going to be talking about compliance and automation. And I think that this is a pretty important subject these days. I mean, certainly cybersecurity in general is uh, is becoming increasingly important for organizations of all sizes, uh, whether they be commercial or, or government focused. Um, the rules and regulations out there are, are only growing to the point where the, the potential penalties for not complying with these various industry requirements and regulatory requirements are, are growing increasingly um, harsh, for lack of better words. So uh, I suspect this is a topic that is going to be very near and dear and, uh, and interesting to a lot of folks. Uh, so to get started, you know, I think there's one thing that we can pretty much all agree on, and that is compliance is hard, uh, but yeah, that's fine. Um, it might make sense to perhaps dig in a little bit and start to investigate why, in fact, compliance is uh, is perceived to be or, or generally um, strikes us as being so difficult. And in order to kind of come to a, a unified understanding of really what compliance is all about, you know, fundamentally, uh, every aspect of compliance that's defined as a control uh, exists to define how one of three things are interacting with your environment. So the first one is, of course, people. Uh, and I think you know, we can probably all agree that that uh, employees, in many cases, are the weakest link in almost any cybersecurity environment, uh, and really any IT environment for that matter, uh, whether it's through social engineering, phishing, um, you know, lack of, of effective um, understanding. You know, all of these things can wreak havoc on, a, uh, on an overall risk profile. Uh, of, of an organization. Um, secondly, we have process. So, you know, fundamentally the lack of repeatable process uh, around how you handle potential incidents and findings in your environment uh, is, is the, the next level of control. And then finally, technology, which I think a lot of people think of cybersecurity really as being technology focused. But those of us that, that live, eat, breathe this on a daily basis recognize that the um, the technology aspect, although very, very important, is not necessarily the end all be all. Uh, and, it, and it certainly in many ways can represent the final line of defense. But if you have a, a lack of uh, rigor around your, uh, your people and you have a lack of rigor around your process, then you know, even the best technology out there is only gonna go so far. So now that we have a general understanding of, of kind of what the various aspects of a particular compliance control are, uh, we can step back and start to look at how that maps into a, a number of, of the different frameworks that you're likely familiar with. So this first example is the example of a, a people control. And I've just pulled this straight from um, you know, the NIST 800-171 uh, special publication. Uh, and you know it's fairly straightforward, like, hey, you got to ensure that managers, systems administrators, and users um, of or, uh, organizational information systems, yada, yada, yada. Uh, I certainly don't need to sit here and read it, but that's a, a fairly straightforward control uh, that addresses people. Um, and now, of course, reading that is one thing. Actually implementing it effectively in your environment is an entirely different thing. If we continue to move forward, another example of a control here is one that's all tied to process. So we pulled this out of 853. Fairly common uh, you know, cybersecurity framework that, uh, that, that many organizations end up using. And this is an example of a, a snippet of uh, something that defines the more rigor around a specific process or set of processes that an organization needs to have. Uh, and so again, you know, it's great and 853 gives you a lot more detail, but there's still going to be some, some likely challenges in, in defining, okay, well, if a process kind of meets all of these requirements, is that all I need to do? Uh, how do I make sure that this process interrelates with other processes and so forth? So, you know, it's important to remember that just answering one particular control is great, but it doesn't necessarily give you the full answer of how all of these things interrelate and how all of the controls kind of play off one another and, and uh, uh, perhaps cause more complexities um, on the grander scale. And then finally, uh, an example of a technology control, again, from um, 800-171, uh, now we're talking about, a, you know what, like turn off non-essential things on your on your system, right? So that's that's much more focused on a specific configuration on a piece of technology. So you know the point in kind of bringing this all together here and talking about common terminology uh, in a common language is that what we have found in many cases in working with the difference between a cybersecurity team uh, to let's say development or let's say let's say IT ops 
for the operations folks is that there often is just a general lack of, of effective language between all of these different teams. Uh, and so we found that that just providing a little bit of level setting uh, ahead of the curve ends up being quite valuable uh, and, and helps ensure that these teams can more effectively communicate. So if we say fundamentally cybersecurity is, is an, a requirement, right? We've got to do it. Uh, and, and there's a lot of penalties and, and uh, problems if we don't. Uh, at the same time, there's a lot of barriers to how we actually go about implementing these things. Uh, so let's dive into some of those barriers. So for starters, we have this just general culture of non-compliance. Uh, and you know this could happen for a number of different reasons. Uh, for starters, digital transformation. You know, I mean, there's been so much effort uh, over the past probably nearly a decade uh, about how we need to transform. You know, we need to move into agile processes, and we need to do all of these these things which which make us a digital first business. Uh, and that's fine, and that's the spectacular. But in many of those cases, uh, the security teams within these businesses have largely been left behind by that transformation. And what you end up with now is a scenario where in order for DevOps to be DevOps, they really kind of ignore security. And we've certainly seen that start to change of late because people are recognizing that, oh, well, if I go fast, like I still need to ensure that I'm deploying securely. Uh, and so, so the whole idea of DevSecOps is, is increasingly popular this, these days. But the, the, the core component here is that for many organizations, the security teams are often still an impediment to, uh, to compliance um, uh, and really an impediment to DevOps, I should say. Uh, and in order to do DevOps properly and fast, you absolutely have to have you know, security hand in hand in there to the point where there really should be no DevOps, it should always be DevSecOps. Uh, but there are things that need to happen on the security teams in order to make that possible. Uh, on the next point here, we have this idea of overinvestment in technology. So uh, there are certainly tons and tons and tons of point solutions. You know, we've got this marketplace slide uh, in another presentation that shows the thousands of vendors that exist out there that are more than happy to sell you uh, additional pieces of technology. And look, by, by all means, I don't want to tell you that technology is bad. Technology is is absolutely critical to cybersecurity posture. But at the same time, um, looking at too many of these point solutions that are that are highly focused on one particular team often are a piece of what caused the, the, the problem um, with how these various teams work with one another. Uh, so understanding that these tools work better when there's a bunch of cross-functional ownership of them and that they're able to benefit a wider uh, cross-section of the business and these cross-functional teams, you're, you're going to end up with better benefit there. And then finally, on the accessibility side, you know, one of the things that drives me crazy because I see it all the time in, in my travels and discussions with customers is that so often the security teams effectively seemingly generate policy and requirements in the ivory tower of some variety, and then they punt them over the wall and say, you know, all right, IT ops, it's on you to figure out how to comply with it. And um, that's just, I think, not helpful, um, but also really incentivizes these other teams to be like, okay, whatever, you know, I'm going to still go and kind of do the bare minimum or do only what I absolutely have to do uh, in order to get you off my back so I can just get my day job done um, because they don't understand and they don't necessarily like having to interface with security. So the culture of non-compliance can be a really big hindrance in, in your overall compliance picture in your environment. Uh, another huge impediment is this idea of uh, a, a lack of comprehensive GRC. So, you know, GRC, of course, exists to measure and, and ultimately define the risk of uh, various aspects to the business. And what we've seen pretty frequently in, in GRC environments is that uh, organizations themselves, even very well-run organizations, often still are treated very much like silos. So, you know, different teams at different levels in the teams, uh, are always needed for all of this organizational buy-in. Uh, often in different teams, you have this kind of cultural mismatch, and that's another example of the that people barrier with their DevOps doesn't really jive with what's going on on the security side. Uh, and the big part there is that really, the, there's plenty of good data that exists. It's just hard to show and understand what other teams might want to, to see. There's no empathy for uh, an understanding about what other teams might want to see data-wise. Uh, the data, of course, also might not be aligned to the right business challenges. So this is a scenario of, of 
how do I make sure that the right data shows up on the right person's desk so that they can make an, an effective and informed decision? And, and notice that, that these certainly are related to compliance, but if you think about it, the, the greater idea here is much bigger than, than even compliance is. Uh, this is in many ways fundamentally about how businesses make decisions. Uh, and it just so happens that that process is, is critically important into cybersecurity posture as well. Um, another big challenge here is shifting requirements. And this is one we certainly see quite frequently. Um, and in fact, you know, probably two times a day I'm on, I'm on phone calls about organ, you know, with, with companies and prospects and, and customers that are having a hard time figuring out how they shift from one thing to another. Uh, you know, one of the most popular ones here now is, is in the um, uh, SI community having to move from, uh, from really uh, the whole kind of dia cap uh, an RMF process to a, uh, which is um, self, you know, it's effectively self-governed and we're going to talk more about that, but having to move from that to a full CMMC process is quite, uh, is quite vexing. Uh, you know, and often interagency regulations are falling behind, they're actually quite a bit behind kind of what the broader, uh, the broader community is, um, is accepting at the moment. You know, a good example there is this whole idea of CIS benchmarks versus STIG. You know, if you look at all of the CIS benchmarks that exist for system security, um, there are many, 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 many more um, for different applications and different application types and different infrastructure types than there are even, even STIG definitions. And, you know, I guess there was some recent um, guidance that in many cases using CIS benchmarks um, for systems that technically needed to be, uh, have the STIG applied, were going to be uh, acceptable. But that still doesn't mean that your actual agency uh, let's say the agency accreditation body that you're working with is going to be willing to accept that. So, you know, if you need to, let's say, apply a stig to a piece of, of cloud infrastructure and there isn't one, what do you do? Uh, and, and so those shifting requirements end up causing a lot of problems because fundamentally these things really aren't static. And even if you were to generate some type of, uh, uh, of compliance engine at a point in time, well, ultimately those requirements are still going to change and you're going to have to end up putting more work into it. And for many, many, many organizations, it's just not your, uh, it's not your ability. It's not why you exist. It's not your, your reason for being. And so the question is, then, you know, what can we ultimately do about all that? Uh, you know, just to give some more examples here, this is a, an example of a, a DIACAP definition versus an RMF de definition. So DIACAP, of course, for the uninitiated, um, relies heavily or not entirely on um, NIST 800.171 with some additional stuff layered in. Um, in this particular case, this is effectively the same control. And you see here that the NIST requirement is, uh, the 853 requirement, I should say, is far more in depth and offers far more kind of control-based information uh, in that particular thing. So just moving from a DIACAP to an RMF basis for your uh, assessments has the possibility of costing, you know, hundreds if not thousands of hours of, of work from your team. So it's a challenge. Um, you know, again, on the, the capability model mature, uh, the capability maturity model certification or CMMC. So this is the, the new requirement that is actually shifting from DFARS over to, uh, which is, was a, uh, a self attestation. So basically the, the system integrators, DOD contractors would raise their hand and say, yep, like we've done our best to comply by this. And, and I bet you in many cases, they were probably taking a deep breath and crossing their fingers that they wouldn't be directly tested or audited against that. You know, certainly they would do their best because it was their duty and responsibility to do as such. But um, in those scenarios where the government actually did audits, um, I'm willing to bet that many of those organizations likely had a number of findings, uh, significant findings. Um, and in fact, we can look across uh, just many of the uh, the breach announcements that have that have occurred in various integrated uh, integrator communities to see that all right, well, that would have been caught you know, had you done these basic things. So the whole CMMC process is going to be hugely disruptive. In fact, it already is. Um, even though the CMMC definition is out, uh, there aren't any hard requirements to do it just yet, but those requirements are absolutely coming. And this is a pay to play. If you do not have that uh, CMMC validation and you are not certified, you at the appropriate level, you are not going to be able to deliver federal contracts, specifically DOD federal contracts. So this is a problem. Um, and in order to get this, uh, the certification organizations are going to need a, a, a 3PAO or a CPPAO. 
and we're anticipating that my point, certainly my, my business will, will be one of those organizations. We already do this for FedRAMP uh, and that's kind of the granddaddy of, uh, of all of these. So CMMC is, is big and you can kind of see this in the space with, with all of the, the various folks that are popping up saying they can help organizations with this. And then of course, as, as the guy who used to run the Ansible business uh, inside Red Hat, um, near and dear to my heart, uh, one of the other big challenges here really is around too many manual processes. Uh, so no matter how you look at it, that you know, most cybersecurity shops, most organizations have a lot of manual activity around these things. Um, whether it be that the various information or pieces of information they need for GRC are spread everywhere. Uh, and I joke with the spreadsheets like a lot. <laughs> the, the pretty sure business would not happen if not for spreadsheets. Or really IT would not happen if not for spreadsheets, whether it be network management or asset management or whatever, it, it's, it's unbelievable the amount of data that exists in these different spreadsheets. And then making sure those spreadsheets are kept up with, and then making sure they're readily shared, and then making sure that people have the right versions, and then making sure the right data is in them is really um, quite a fantastically huge and distributed problem. Um, furthermore, you have all these different apps and systems uh, and all this data that's just stored in all these places. You have emails that are going back and forth. You have different teams that are handling different aspects. So this GRC data that the business fundamentally needs in order to calculate and understand risk uh, is, is totally distributed. Um, and it's not just distributed in one mode, it's, it's kind of all over the board. Uh, and then another big reason here is that you see that um, a lot of responsibility for all of this lands on really the wrong or the ill-equipped team. So uh, this is kind of the difference between what a customer needs versus what that internal requirement is. You have separation of duty issues, and in some cases it's the, the control or the policy itself or the requirement itself for compliance that has actually causing some of these issues, but again, it's about communication, understanding how to kind of pull these things together. Uh, and then sometimes people just don't even know the policy, right? It comes down to kind of a people and education process, but but it's it's all too manual and it's it's not automated and not set up to work in a, in a kind of a consistent and straightforward flow. Uh, of course, all of these things will impede your journey to DevSecOps, which is likely where everyone on this call wants to go. And uh, in such of that, not just impeding DevSecOps, but your ability to securely and effectively implement um, compliance and really securely and effectively implement, deploy, and maintain applications in your environments. Okay, so that was really heavy, and everyone's probably really depressed because um, sometimes this is <laughs> this is kind of maddening. But we've evaluated the problem, so let's talk about some of the things that we can now do to fix it. Uh, again, shouldn't really be a big surprise given my background and where I come from. Um, automation, automation is uh, is absolutely critical. Um, from a culture perspective, automation helps because it, when you go to an automation first approach, it changes from a uh, uh, really an I can't do this to, oh, yep, I can do it to now that I've done it, now you can do it. And when you start to think about the, the automation of cybersecurity processes, that which can be automated should be automated and when it is, Wow, lo and behold, guess what? It becomes really easy for other teams to start to adopt those cybersecurity processes. Uh, process automation, um, also incredibly key. So this is understanding that you know when X happens, I need to do Y. Um, let's, you know, maybe we we automate all of the documentation formatting and updating. So when you're deploying an application, the actual all the information necessary for compliance reporting is stored in the same repositories as the actual application code. Uh, it allows you to effectively do uh, you know, CI CD for compliance and it's tied right to your application. So you know, your ATO process is effectively built into your application deployment process. And every time you, you push an update, uh, all of the appropriate documentation is generated. Uh, furthermore, um, it helps with things like uh, gap analyses. So understanding uh, where you are today versus where you really want to be and then allowing the organization, and I know sometimes they're a bit controversial, but I think when they're well done, they can be highly useful, but it's, it's a heat map and it's a risk overview. It's looking at uh, what are the types of things that are likely to happen and uh, an extraordinarily high risk. You focus on solving those problems first before coming back and saying, all right, well, we have something that is extraordinarily high risk, but really, really not likely to happen. Uh, you know, For instance, like a data center burning to the ground, um, unlikely to happen, but extraordinarily high risk. 
So you know, understanding what that risk overview and that mapping looks like can, um, can certainly be partially automated uh, too. Technology uh, is another possible solution here. So when we start to talk about culture, you know, I hit on this before, this is one of the reasons I was immediately drawn to Ansible way back in 2014 before I started on that team, but it, it comes down to uh, a tooling and set of capabilities that really expand rather than limit the audience uh, within your organization. Now, it doesn't mean it can't be a walled garden, but finding things that enable broad participation end up being key to this. Um, in terms of process automation, this kind of goes line in line with uh, what I talked about before, where, look, if I see this particular activity, I need to go, you know, let's say, collect more information and then do X, Y, and Z, and perhaps either do something automatically or notify someone. So doing that with, with tools like the CSAM that allow you to take action uh, layer your technology. So, you know, every good um, set of defenses is is multiple defenses. You, know, you just don't have a wall, you've got a moat with a wall, uh, and, you know, maybe alligators or something. I don't know. Um, I think you understand what I'm, what I'm getting at there. Um, and then fundamentally, the technology that you select really needs to integrate. So the, the fewer silos you have here, the better off you're going to be. Uh, so, you know, it's more so than I think just pulling and looking for, for tools with APIs, but it's understanding and making sure you have the talent and the teams that are capable of uh, and have the time and the charges really to to integrate these things. Okay, so that was a kind of a quick run through of, of some of the things that you can do. You know, the next big question is how do you get started? Um, you know, a big piece of this really comes down to your ability to empower the people. So the the training direction on policy and process is critical. And in fact, any of the, the NIST guidelines, any of the, the compliance frameworks have a, usually have a pretty significant amount of, of kind of training requirements that exist in there. Um, I mentioned it before, but it, it bears repeating again and again and again. You've got to unify these disparate teams around common tooling and common languages. You have to make sure that they truly understand what the others are concerned about and, and understand that every action that they take is likely going to have a, a, a a kind of cause a reaction or cause something to happen elsewhere. So when when the the cyber team or the cybersecurity team punts a new policy over the wall, they have to understand that that that's going to cause you know perhaps compliance struggles uh, as a result of all of the other teams kind of scramble to to meet those new requirements and so forth. So just a little bit more empathy on those things and, and understanding how to kind of pull these folks together is uh, is critical. Um, automate processes. Start with small stuff. Um, you know, it, it never ceased to amaze me. The organizations in the Ansible timeframe that were most successful were always the ones that started small. Uh, and that doesn't mean you can't move quickly as well, but, you know, pick a couple of, of uh, they don't even have to be the easiest of tasks, but pick a couple of, of highly repeatable things and, you know, automate one of them. And then when you finish that one, automate another one and another one and another one, and you grow from there. And what will likely come out of that is, uh, is as you develop a better muscle memory and a better uh, organizational capability around automation, it's going to make a lot of that GRC stuff a bit easier. So when you start to provide people the ability to, you know, perhaps play into your automated uh, environment and your automation uh, code base, it's going to allow them to to do a better job of getting access to, uh, to the types of things that will help them out. And then finally, learn from those that have done it. You know, I mean, there, there are an increasingly larger number of uh, of security meetups and certainly security automation meetups. Uh, I know Ansible has been working um, in the security automation space for, for a, a bit of time now, um, but there are a number of other other kind of platforms and, and ways to get together with with fellow security and IT ops folks that are that are mindful on security to start to talk about how uh, how some of these things can, can ultimately be done at scale. And then finally, you got to be able to select the right technology. Um, you know the the scenario where security teams start to choose tools that are really built and only meant for them, uh, I think, is a um, is at a detriment to our overall ability to ensure uh, these environments remain secure. Uh, and then, furthermore, don't necessarily rely on those internal teams to build 100% of the content. You know, we talked earlier about how many of these operations teams often are poorly equipped to effectively handle the policy in the way that the policy is delivered uh, by the cybersecurity team. This is an opportunity really to, um, to perhaps look outside the organization, whether that be through services, you know, selfishly or product, 
uh, to, to help you understand how to bridge those gaps. Uh, and then finally, in the selection of various pieces of technology, you know, the, the tech that, let's say, the IT ops folks select really need to be made with GRC in mind. Uh, you don't pick things that might be perfect for your particular use case, but cause all kinds of additional issues on the GRC side without understanding what that impact is and how perhaps you as an IT operations professional would be able to help, uh, would be able to help um, ultimately improve that. Okay, so um, that concludes the, the main meat of the conversation. Um, I do have a number of other kind of additional context slides here where we can talk about uh, some next steps and some opportunities for you as an organization to improve your overall posture. Uh, for starters, um, you can start with the compliance assessment. You know, fundamentally, I think that one of the struggles for many organizations are that you, know, you, you don't even frequently understand exactly where you sit. So you know that you might have a, a compliance requirement for NIST or, or something like that, um, 853, 171, whatever. Um, and you don't even understand fully where your organization sits in relation to the work that it's gonna take to get there. Um, and I'm sure there are many, many cybersecurity organizations and businesses would love to step up and be like, yep, we will, you know, for the tidy sum of a million and change dollars, be happy to step up and help you get compliant to that. I would argue that really you need to understand where you are first. So the, the, the first and probably the best and quickest thing that you can do is, is set up an assessment. Um, part of that can potentially be a, if you haven't selected a framework yet, uh, organizations such as MindPoint can help you understand what the most appropriate or best framework would be uh, for your organization based on your risk profile. Um, furthermore, um, if you do have a regulatory requirement, then certainly um, we or someone like us could help you with the uh, with identifying uh, really where you are and develop a pretty a pretty thorough hit list of the things that you need to do, uh, starting from the most critical to the least critical uh, in order to get compliant. Um, baseline automation. Uh, so this is kind of a no-brainer, right? I mean, I mentioned earlier about technology being the the uh, uh, really the the last um, hurrah, the really last possible uh, barrier uh, to attackers in your environment. Um, there's a lot of that that can be automated. You can automate the application of STIG or CIS benchmarks in your environment. You can um, fully integrate all of that into your lifecycle and overall manage, IT management operations processes. Uh, and furthermore, you need to do this in a way that, that not just audits current state, but also allows you to continually remediate. Uh, that would be huge, right? I mean, we've all seen the scenario where, well, you know, it was compliant when I deployed it. Uh, but you know, ongoing compliance is a moving target, and when you when you start to look at overall environment compliance, often one of the weaker links, other than the people, ends up being um, an organization's ability to maintain the baseline compliance uh, in those environments. Um, and then just kind of coming back again to uh, the GR the GRC assessment. So you know, finding outside help to help you understand where you are can be very very important. Um, we are very good at finding blind spots. We are very, very good at uh, understanding based on the current, you know, current level of threat in the in the community. What are the things that uh, that are things that you needed to do yesterday versus what are the things that you can kick the can down the road a little bit on? And then, of course, we can we can help you uh, on a number of different frames, um, a number of different points uh, around that. So. Uh, finally, to just kind of wrap this up, um, what I would love to do is just run through a very brief introduction, you know, try not to make it too salesy, but want to talk a little bit more about where MindPoint Group has, uh, has come from. So, uh, you know, perhaps I should have started with this, but um, what I've found is that people often like to hear the meat of it before they figure out, <laughs> you know, like, why am I really here? What are they trying to sell me? Uh, you know, in the end, MindPoint Group is a, it's a cybersecurity consultant business. We've been around for uh, more than a decade, uh, and all we've ever done is cybersecurity. So you know, one thing I would say is that as cybersecurity has become um, a larger uh, and larger budget line item for IT organizations, uh, there have been more and more businesses that have been willing to pivot into cybersecurity. Uh, we are not one of those businesses. We have been doing uh, cybersecurity and only cybersecurity for the entirety of our business. Um, we are full services, so we we have the ability to to really go end to end. Um, we do a significant amount of business with the federal government, also uh, also with commercial organizations. Uh, we are really at once agile, experienced, and forward thinking. 
um, I'll let you all kind of read the, the summary bullet points here, but we move very quickly. We have a significant amount of empathy for the, uh, for the actual developers and we uh, understand the, uh, we understand the challenges that larger organizations have uh, in order to uh, in order to move these uh, these processes forward, and then finally, we do this in the idea that that you're not just building for today; you need to be building and selecting technologies for the next five years. So, how do we immediately improve your position while providing uh, uh, providing you a pathway to the future? So, not just today's threats, but the ones that uh, have not yet been identified. Um, our customers are are pretty wide reaching. We've got a fair number of them. Um, this is just a sampling. Don't necessarily need to go into any of these, but again, um, fairly well deployed, fairly well adopted. Uh, and, um, we've got uh, you know ongoing engagements at a, at a broad range of both federal and commercial organizations. Uh, and then finally, um, no presentation that I deliver would be uh, complete if I didn't talk at some level about Ansible. And at that, we do have a product here called Lockdown Enterprise. Um, it is originally um, founded from a, a kind of a, a partnership that uh, I did while working at Ansible with the MindPoint Group. And of course, I ultimately now work for the MindPoint Group at Lockdown Enterprise as a set of security baselines automated in Ansible that allow you to save time, uh, increase your compliance, and uh, broaden the overall coverage and support of what you're able to do from a security baseline perspective. Uh, lots of really interesting features, totally flexible, um, allows you to turn various aspects of it on and off, all using native Ansible, uh, and all allowing you to uh, actually validate compliance and validate that these have been applied uh, or that a system is compliant, as well as uh, fundamentally remediate that in a very flexible manner. Of course, we will run this in any mode that you've got. Uh, so existing DevOps tool chains, no problem. Using Ansible Tower, also no problem. Want to run it from the command line. Fundamentally, no problem. And with that, uh, I conclude. So, um, in summary, uh, what we've discussed here is that compliance is hard. Uh, we did discuss a number of the barriers to make uh, help better explain why it's hard, uh, as well as fundamentally, what are the the core components of a security control that uh, that you know number of controls ultimately are what make up an overall compliance picture. And then finally, we talked about the various things that you as an organization can do, regardless of whether you're in the security team or the IT ops team or development team, the types of things that you can do and the behaviors that you can exhibit that will uh, absolutely help improve your overall compliance and thus your cybersecurity posture.